section numbers of our science for a Good evening. This is the second time I'm coming to the same IMA for a lecture. I came here for the four years back when I was working in SIM. And thank you very much, my colleague at the time. And I was asked to select a topic, and I've chosen this topic because I know the audience here is mostly of general practitioners. You will be expected to answer to many of the questions to your patients. So mainly to make you understand how you will be able to answer these questions. Do I need to undergo any intervention at all? That will be the first question your patient will be asking you. Will drugs not suffice? And if it has been decided as intervention that it is angioplasty or surgery, and whether it needs to be done immediately or we can postpone it. All these decisions, they will be expecting you to give them an advice. And to be frank with you, there are so many vested interests involved in making these decisions. A lot of commercial interests, a lot of unscientific aspects in making a decision. So, I thought I will encourage you to think about certain facts based on the latest available European guidelines on myocardial vascularization. This is the authority I'm going to quote. Of course, I think I skipped this slide. This only refers to what I mean by class 1, 2, 3. And then levels of evidence you want to know. The most important aspect to decide is, is not an ad hoc decision to be made within a few split seconds. It is a decision to be based, to be made jointly, involving the cardiologist who has done the angiogram, the cardiologist who normally the patient himself, who may not be a catheterizing cardiologist, is called as a non-invasive cardiologist. And the family physician, that will be you, the cardiac surgeon, the patient, and the patient's family. It has to be a joint discussion with all questions answered, all doubts clear. And this is supposed to be the standard of care today in the West, that you have to have a heart deep approach. Basically, the patient uh, can present to you in various ways. Like, he can present with a stable coronary artery disease, he can present with an ST elevation MI, or an all ST elevation MI to coronary syndrome, or he can present with shock. And he can have multiple comorbidities, like he may have diabetes, he may have carotid disease, he may have kidney disease, or it may be a redo intervention. So these are all the various uh, presentations you may meet with. I find you today, you have got a lot of objective ways of making these decisions. Because I told you in the beginning itself, there are a lot of vested interests in it. As far as possible, we should be able to be very objective in making it. And all these things are available in public domain. All you have to do is, whichever you can go by any of the scoring system, all of them are most standard. I personally recommend the, uh, recommend the syntax to score now. If you put, uh, if you go to Google and uh, type syntax to score, you will be able to get a calculator. And you can calculate a lot of things about the patient and make a, a very informed decision. Just a few minutes on what it is. This is one of the largest studies of uh, coronary artery disease, comparing the angioplasty with bypass surgery. Based on what is the disease the patient is suffering from. First, you have to chart out what the disease the patient is suffering from. Everybody with a three vessel block is not safe. Because if you see here, a three vessel block at this point is five times as dangerous as a three vessel block but involving this side. This is the right coronary artery, this is left coronary artery, this is left anterior descending, this is left circumference. So based on the size that which the block is, the weight factor varies. So all this is available in the public domain today. All you have to do is put the syntax to the score, you will get this. You have got a coronary angiogram. Actually, ideally, the catheterizing cardiologist is supposed to give you this number. But as I told you in the beginning itself, there are so many other confounding factors. This objective information is not shared with anybody. But it's not difficult. You will be able to calculate it. And then you will make a decision. What is the score? That is what is going to. That is one of the important decisions. Based on that, you will make a decision. I just want to invite your attention about the diagnostic testing also. Nowadays, it has become a fashion. Sir, I had a chest pain. Immediately, I went and had a CT chest. 
See, it is not an innocuous investigation. CT coronary angiogram is not an innocuous investigation. One CT coronary angiogram is equal to taking 100 X-rays. It produces so much of radiation exposure. 20 years down the line, he may be a candidate who develops a lymphoma. The only indication for coronary angiogram is a patient with a high probability of significant disease. And for CT angio, if there is an intermediate risk of significant disease. It is important for you to understand that CT coronary angiogram is not an important investigation to make a decision about revascularization. Its negative predictive value is very high. If CT coronary angiogram is normal, then you can assure the patient you are not likely to develop serious myocardial problems. The negative predictive value is high, but positive predictive value is not high. So if you suspect disease, how will you suspect? By going through the, the probability of significant disease. That again, you can get it from the net. You simply write CAD probability. You have got about 10, 15 scores available. You fill up all this with available information. You will get an idea of what is the probability of you developing a coronary artery disease. If the probability is high, that is greater than 80 according to the calculation, you send in for a coronary angiogram, conventional coronary angiogram. If it is intermediate, you send in for CT coronary angiogram. If it is low or if the patient is asymptomatic, please do not do any investigations. There will be a lot of vested interest in advising on this. If it is a stable coronary artery disease, there are two reasons why you should recommend surgery. One is for symptom relief. If the angina is very severe, not controlled with medicines, you have to advise surgery or antiparticles. Then for prognosis, so based on this, all this, whatever I do, you need not worry about it, everything is available in the public domain. If you put the CAT guidance, you get all this. Based on that. You see, if the patient has got a left brain disease with a high syntax score, surgery is class 1 indication and angioplasty is class 2 or class 3. Similarly, in triple dose disease, with a syntax score of more than 23, class 1 is CABG, class 3 is sorry, class 3 is PCA. This is the latest guideline. However, if it is a single dose disease not involving proximal left anterior descending coronary artery, angioplasty is superior to bypass. So everything is there in the domain. You have to just see that and you will be able to advise the patient. If the patient comes with a STEMI, just the elevation in mind, do not waste time. Time is muscle. Every minute comes. Every minute you are losing some myocardial cells. You have no time to think. You have to immediately advise the patient to go to the nearest center where angioplasty is available and immediately save the patient by doing an angioplasty. That is the one and the only method available today to save myocardial cells. Suppose you are in a place, in Kodapakar there is not a problem because you have got so many nearby hospitals who can do angioplasty. Supposing you are in a far off place where it takes more than one hour to reach an angioplasty center, then the next best is to do fibrolysis. I am not going into the discussion of which fibrolytic drug you should use, but you must give fibrolysis and then shift the patient for uh, angiogram within 24 hours. So any patient with ST elevation may be less than 12 hours, or any patient greater than 12 hours, also if the patient has got angina or arrhythmia, or if the patient has got hemodynamic instability, that patient should be sent immediately for angioplasty. And if fibrinolysis has been done within 24 hours, the patient should have a coronary angiogram, conventional coronary, not CT coronary angiogram, a conventional coronary angiogram, because this is a high probability of significant disease. He has already developed a STEMI. So send him for an angio grab conventional coronary within the next 24 hours and then based on what you find you make a decision. The role of COBG in acute coronary syndrome is very limited. It is only for mechanical complications of myocardial infarction like the patient developed a severe mitral regurgitation, patient developed a ventricular septal defect, patient developed rupture, in those cases of COBG. Otherwise, it is mainly angioplasty. Or otherwise, it is an anatomy like, you know, syntax score of 32, where you cannot do an angioplasty, technically impossible. In such cases, maybe CABG has got a role. In non-STEMI, you go by the risk factors. If the troponin has elevated, or if there is a dynamic STT changes, or is a diabetic, or renal insufficiency, whenever you have got all the high risk factors, those 
If those high risk factors are there, then you send them early for coronary angiogram and then make a decision. When the patient comes with a cardiogenic shock, you start an inodrome, you ventilate the patient electively, resuscitate if he has got some ventricular arrhythmias, and then as early as possible you must reperfuse either by angioplasty or surgery depending on the anatomy. And after that, if you are not able to wean the patient off, it's a very strong indication for mechanical circulatory support. Till recently, we had only intraiotic balloon pump. That was the only thing available till very recently. But now, in the last four or five years, every hospital has got now extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And thanks to the former CM, now that word has become so common. So, ECMO is a life saving thing, provided the patient is neurologically intact. So, you put an IABP or you put an echo, after 24 hours you make a decision whether yeah. urologically the patient is intact. If the patient is neurologically intact, you can continue the ECMO for about 3 to 6 weeks and then think of either the patient can be weaned if the myocardium is recovered or think of a transplantation or an artificial heart. Diabetics. In patients with stable multivessel coronary artery disease, CABG is recommended over angioplasty. That is because when we talk of CABG, we are talking about 20 years. If the chances of this patient living for the next 20 years is much higher, when he undergoes an angioplasty, uh, when he undergoes a bypass surgery compared to angioplasty, immediate results may be superior and attractive in angioplasty. But if we talk about long term results, CABG scores so well. Same with respect to coronary artery. If the patient is not a very poor surgical risk, then he should undergo CABG. But however, if the patient has got a limited life expectancy, then there is no point in sending this patient for surgery. Angioplasty is a very good alternative. But if you do angioplasty in these patients with diabetics or coronary, uh, kidney disease, they should have a drug agent instant. That's very important. <coughs> when do you do a carotid screening? Any patient who has had a TIA, transient ischemic attack, or even a your Frank neurology or deficit in the last six months, so, or if he has got a carotid brewing, that patient should undergo a doctor's test before undergoing a venous conversation. And depending on the finding, if he has got a significant coronary artery disease, if he has got a significant carotid artery disease, by which we mean a greater than 70-80% stenosis, ulcerated block, or if he has had a TA in the last six weeks, uh, six months, then he should undergo a carotid revascularization in addition to coronary. I will be keep all this up. If you want to have a CABG, you should insist that the patient gets at least two points. Single to internal memory action. Doing just vein grafts is not good. As far as possible, insist upon arterial contours. Internal memory artery or a radial artery gives a better long term result than just doing a vein graft. Whether you should do off pump or on pump, that's another question they sometimes may ask you. <coughs> Well, there is no control trial which says one is superior to other, but if the patient has got a kidney disease or if the patient has got a recent neurological deficit, then probably off pump anaerobic approach where you don't touch the aorta will give better results than doing it off pump. Then what is hybrid coronary revascularization? What that means is that you just do a single bypass surgery to the LAD. The LAD supplies about 60 to 70 percent of the myocardium. So you use the lima to LOD. That is why a direct or you don't make a big sternotomy. You can do the minimally invasive approach. And the, all the rest can be done with angioplasty because if you are going to put a vein up to them, probably uh, aspirin also is equally good. That is what is called a hybrid. That is you do surgery plus angioplasty. That's what is called hybrid. The same thing you can do. What is important to understand is that doing a CMBG or an angioplasty is not the end of the problem. It is the beginning of the problem. You have to be on dress for lifetime. The patient that may be symptomatic or not symptomatic may have a normal LV function, may not have any limitation, that doesn't mean he can be off drugs. He has to be on four drugs for lifetime. Antiplatelet agent, either aspirin or clopidogrel or both, depending on the severity of the disease. An anti-lipid agent, statins, a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker if his LV function is depressed, and an AC inhibitor and ARB. If he is a diabetic, if he is a kidney disease patient, or if he has got a compromised health function. These four drugs have to be taken for life. But whatever we say, whatever report you get, never believe them because this is the 
what is going to be the editor of the NAGM. He was an editor for 20 years. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the critical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most reputed journals in the medical field. So, you have to consult multiple sources, you have to make your own judgment, and you will be able to advise your patients accordingly. The aim of therapy has all, primum non nauseum, that is, first do no harm. So you have to educate yourself, get all the maximum information, and then pass on to your patient. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah.
cardiac arrest. You have to do a closed chest cardiac arrest. Never do an open cardiac arrest. Because that is very cardiac is intact. When you do a compression, the ventricular filling and emptying will be very effective. As long as the pericardium is intact, closed chest cardiac massage produces a great, greater cardiac output than a, an open cardiac massage. When the pericardium is open, a closed chest cardiac massage will simply display the heart this way and that way and you will not have enough ejection. The same is true, supposing uh, the patient has abdomen is in the, has, uh, in the process of an abdomen. The abdomen is wide open. He developed a cardiac arrest. Doing a closed chest cardiac massage will not be effective. The heart will simply get displaced, the diaphragm will down. So the best thing is just work on the diaphragm, just make one slash in the diaphragm, put your hand up and keep pressing the heart from behind forwards to the back of the sternum, you will produce very good cardiac. So it depends on the setting. We have saved many patients by resorting to open cardiac massage and it is the first recommended strategy in cardiac arrest in post cardiac surgery state, but not in cardiac arrest.